Patrick, what did you see when you were there of the relationship of Mondragon to land use and farming and sustainability? So they have a few workers' cooperatives in farming, but they didn't think that it was important to let, you know, it was, we were very structured. I mean, this thing was like, you know, it's, it was put on by the Praxis Peace Institute. They've done it for about 15 years. And I would have preferred to just be able to wander around, but I, I have to be able to speak the language to really do that. So I couldn't really argue with that. They did make sure that we always talked to people who spoke English, you know. Um, but yeah, we really w wished we could have gone to a farm, but we didn't get to go to a farm, you know. But they do have, they've got a dairy thing, and it's like, I think, a thousand cows. I think that's my, Dan, do you remember? Wasn't it a thousand cows that they had? Yeah. Um, but a thousand cows is a lot of milk, and for that area, you know, and they also had a, like market garden kind of like greenhouse operation, like salad mix and stuff like that, you know? But actually, both Dan and I thought that like, you know, what we're doing here at Living Web and what you're doing and stuff, that we're actually considerably ahead. They're way ahead on the organization and workers control and all that, but they're very much looking at where, what will produce profits that they can then put into their community. Not so much at like what needs to be done, you know? And yeah, we won't make any money. How many farmers make money? You know, so, you know. so if it's farming, it's going to pay if they're going to do it. Yes? It sounds like kind of the missing piece is really the cultural piece from what I'm hearing. It sounds like you're saying challenges in co-ops in this country is that kind of missing piece. And I think the lesson is education. You know? And it's also a commitment to like coming to agreements and staying, and staying with them. I mean, to me, the huge fault of the swallow was that there might have been four people out of like, I think it was probably about 13, 14 people that worked there. They were there because it was a cooperative, you know? Basically, it was a job, you know? And they didn't really, I mean, you know, we had two employees that were ripping us off, you know? Um, you know and no cooperative would ever have, a, you know, you just, that doesn't, you know? And at the same time, I watched a really impressive cooperative infrastructure in the Berkeley area, like several, like probably four or five supermarkets, a bank, a garden center, all kinds of cooperative things that, that like arose from the response to the, the depression, you know, and in that time when America was actually investing in culture, you know, in its, in its culture, in its people, because they were out of step, because, you know, the people didn't still get that cooperative message. And indeed, I don't want to spend much time on it, but some, a pitfall we have to avoid that they weren't able to avoid, and I, I witnessed in another situation when I it was a cooperative that I ran and then went to like regional meetings, is that there are oppressed groups, right, that are looking for some place to get some recognition, to get some space, to get cared about. And of course, a cooperative movement is where that's, there's going to be space. So what happened in, in the Berkeley area was it a whole lot of prisoners, you know, who had been, you know, pretty much abused, right, got out and went into the cooperative movement. Of course, they brought all their problems, too. And they, you know, crashed some pretty, you know, seriously crashed some cooperatives that way. Yes? Uh, I just want to ask you if you were able to uh, see what do they do at Mondragon about housing? Do they take a cooperative vote? Oh, yeah. They, there's, <laughs> there are all kinds of modern apartments in, in our Sate Mondragon, and they're a whole lot of them were owned by Mondragon. They, yeah, they've, they, have a, they have a construction um, cooperative. They have like, you know, housing cooperatives. Yeah, it's, yeah. They're, like I said, vertical, you know. They're doing it all. You know? I'm in real estate, so I'm interested in, you know, what kind of things we can implement here mm -hmm. to, to bring a cooperative approach to housing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I think we have to invent our own things here, but we can look at their models. They're really good. For looking at like, you know, equitable structures and stuff, you know, like, um, I was going to get to it, but like, if it, this is just an example, it's not directly to housing, but, you know, they have it figured out. There's a formula, right? Company makes profits, which they do mostly, because, you know, and I mean, they actually lost their biggest company to the um, recession and globalization in 2000, I think it was 13 or something. So it's not like they never fail. And I'm going to tell that story because I think it's really illustrative of what, of how they, of what their response is and, their, and solidarity. But they mostly make profits. And how they deal with profits is there's a formula, right? 10% by law. I thought it was just the um, you know, Mondragon. And I think they probably would have done it even if they weren't required to. But by Basque law, 
you have to give 10% of your profits to charitable causes. You get to say which ones they are, but you know, you have to do that, you know? It's not like, oh, I want to, you know, but you have to, right? Um, and not like some, you know, nonprofit you set up to push your agenda, you know? Um, but to real, you know, real causes. Okay, 60% is retained to be inve in invested back in that business or if need be in other cooperatives, right? So there's incredible liquidity, right? Um, mostly if you did well, it's going back in your business, but if there's a business that needs it more, it goes there. Right. Sixty percent of the profits from each business are retained for reinvestment. Yes. Yeah. And forty percent then. Oh, I, this is a separate question I have, but the forty percent are profits distributed. Ten. Ten percent have to be given to charity, right? Our community investments of some sort. Okay. The other thirty percent goes to the workers. But if you're a member of the cooperative, you have to invest it, and, ca and you have to put it back into capitalizing the the Mondragon network. You get it when you retire. Or you get it if you quit. So that goes into like a pension or something. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or if you quit, you get it too. But that's used as an investment fund. It's it used as like. an investment, investment fund. fund. That's why they pension. have this yeah. powerful economic engine. Right. You know. Yeah. And essentially, that formula. Then there's similar formulas for other things that they that they do. You know, they always have formulas. So I didn't. We didn't learn. They didn't give us. We covered a whole lot of the different things they have, but we didn't get told about how they do the housing. So I don't know the details of that. But it, there's probably some paper on it. I mean, they, they've got it written up pretty well, you know? Um, yeah. So Mondragon, they have privately owned businesses in that town too, right? Or oh, yeah, it, sure. Yeah. So, so, so is it half would be operated by the Mondragon co-ops and half? Or, uh, I'm not sure how many really, but they... It's a big town though, right? I mean, it's not it's a good sized town. I'm guessing, Dan, what do you think? It's, I was going to say about the housing. Um, for one, everything's walking distance. So there's a lot of people packed in a really tight little yeah. valley there. Yeah. And those houses are old. They're like, well, they're all like, you know, we think of public housing kind of being shoddy and run down. They're like really well taken care of. And every morning we get up and there'd be street sweepers or somebody out pressure washing the sidewalk or, or something like that. So there's a lot of, um, um, care yeah civic responsibility taken towards those houses they're not you know and very few standalone houses in that community yeah. I, were there um, any yeah i took a day i actually got lost i took a day um just walking around it took me maybe four hours to walk the entire circumference of the town um and i got like crazy lost going up weird stairways and down alleyways and all that kind of stuff it was a blast but um um I don't know if that helps your question about housing at all. It does. That's, that's good to know. It's not at all like here, you know. Uh, not how I'm, uh, you know, it's nothing like Reams Creek and Weaverville. You know, I couldn't walk to the grocery store if I wanted to. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that helps. Thanks. I want to ch chime in about that too then, because yeah. this whole thing of settlement patterns, right? Uh, this is like a prime concern of, of permaculture and people who study the long term. Um, trajectory of our culture and human ecosystems is how have we set up our communities and settlement patterns in the landscape before there was abundant fossil fuel energy, right? On the presumption that we're going to have to probably set ourselves up with similar patterns after abundant fossil fuel energy. And so there's a whole book, Patterns Language, that goes into that. Um, that was kind of a, a um, founding piece on that. So all of this has to go hand in hand with that. We can't in anticipate having successful um, widespread housing cooperative development unless we start to address settlement patterns, right? And if we, if, unless we set ourselves up to establish settlement patterns where it is walkable, even if it's in, in rural areas, where people are close enough to be able to collaborate for childcare, elder care, food access, healthcare, we have to be close enough that that's not splintered and fragmented by the distance of habitation, right? And so this immediately starts tying into land use planning, right? And to how farms are laid out and where we concentrate people. And then how can we have people living within walking distance of the farms that they're growing the food on? And it, so it all starts to tie in quickly there. I wanted to point out another little pattern and, or principle in the, a later kind of uh, the point that Pat was making from about the, um, the retirement funds coming out of the percentage of profit from the co-op businesses. So this is a thing to start looking for 
um, in design of our own regional mutual aid network is where are there um, flows of money and resources that are currently supporting things that most of us maybe don't support, but that are kind of low hanging fruits for catching and diverting those resources to support things we do su support. So I'll give you an example. I, I'm living in, um, at Earth Haven where I live, we have a, a housing co-op, it's my neighborhood, it's a, it's a cooperative. And so the, right, the co-op owns the, um, all the buildings and then we all have occupancy agreements, just like people who live in urban housing co-ops have occupancy agreements and that's what you own, not the building. Um, and so we're, we're investigating, uh, okay, are we gonna all buy fire insurance? Because we had this huge catastrophic fire, if any of y'all remember a couple autumns ago, sweep through and we were all like out, you know, chopping trees down with chainsaws and breaking stuff away from the houses and cutting down all the bushes. And it was crazy because this fire came to the ridge right up the, up the hill from Earth Haven. And um, so we're investigating, should we buy fire insurance, uh, home insurance for all these buildings that our housing co-op owns? This would cost about, um, $800 to $1,400 a building a year. So for our neighborhood, 15 buildings, right, you're looking at somewhere in the, in the realm of like twelve dollars to $20,000 a year that just our neighborhood could be pumping into some random home insurance industry. And we're like, actually, why don't we start our own, our own insurance fund, right? We, let's put that same amount of money into a money market account with self-help credit union that we have now and we have access to that money, right? And of course there's higher risk for the first few years. Like if a catastrophic fire came through and burned down five buildings, we'd be screwed. But after about five years, we start to have enough reservoir of money in there to actually start to cover some risk. And then we can start investing that money in things in our neighborhood at low interest rate. So suddenly, just through rethinking that and recognizing that flow of resources, we gain access to some pretty powerful resourcing to support the things that we need, right? So it's part of what we're doing is scouting out where are the flows of energy and money and resources and human energy that we're currently, in a sense, squandering that we can pretty easily tuck back in, all of it takes effort, but that we can tuck those threads back in to what we are doing in our communities and start to have that energy fold in on itself and support what we're trying to do. So kind of, that's a principle, is to look out for those flows, yeah. Do they do the same thing with the medical uh, insurance and yep. medical needs? They, they, and based. Mondragon totally does. They, Spain has universal health care like the rest of the world does, you know. We're the only developed country that has a, a continually eroded, like, lousy plan in the first place. But they had a, a better plan, but Basically, Mondragon has what would be like supplemental for Medicare. So for $80 a month, you get everything that Spain doesn't give you. you know? um, and so everybody's got it. You know? um, and they have their own you know, pharmacies and whatnot, too. They also, yeah. And how much um, do the people in Mondragon get paid relative to the average worker in Spain? They get paid competitively. Oh. Yeah, yeah. Well, I, ultimately, I think better in the end, you know, um, you know, because they, you know, when that money goes back in, they make sure they they're committed to good jobs. You know, that's that's what they're about. They want good jobs. You know, and indeed, um, you know, I guess I'll jump ahead again because that's the nature of how talks go. Um, one of their branches is their research and development. Like I said, it's it's like you know, renowned through Europe, right? Um, and when we were there, there's nine people that run it, you know? I said, we're a small co cooperative, right? Um, but they said, basically, as they've gotten further away from, you know, Spain, like, took a hit in 2008, but they really got battered in, like, 2014. Their housing thing collapsed, and they just, like, suffered horribly. And indeed, that's, I'll get to it, how they lost their major industry. They had a horrible recession. And... At that time, loads more people came and they helped to create more, you know, they had the research and development to help create many more cooperatives because people needed jobs, right? They said, now we don't get hardly any people coming to us because they're all these good jobs. You know, why would somebody take the risk, you know? But they still, I was pretty impressed. And indeed, I didn't think to ask a key question like, like you know, 
jet lag and not enough coffee. You know? <laughs> but I, I thought to ask, okay, so what's your budget? You know? And it was like $600,000 a year. And I said, so how many jobs do you create? He said, on average, 70. And I just left it at that. It's like 10,000 bucks for a job? That is, I mean, you think of what, ha what you know, what you got to pay for, what, you know, what Amazon was asking for, you know, in New York and stuff, you know. It's incredibly cost effective. Meanwhile, I forgot that they're also taking contracts from all these corporations in Europe. So I, they're probably making money. They're probably not even losing money. That probably not like, it's not like the, the uh, Mondragon's putting $600,000 in to get those 70 jobs, which they would do. That, that's probably funded by the other research they do, you know. Um, so, you know, it's pretty much, you know, you know, a dedication to creating good jobs. You know? And indeed, they're always looking for, you know, I got a couple examples. Yeah, yes. I just wanted to, I'm curious about how it works. Did they subcontract out work to other companies? Uh, there's a lot of private companies. We... Um, oh, they, it's pretty interesting. They, you know, they try to give business to their own things and stuff, but they have a rule that, like, you know, if they need chairs, right, they're going to get the best chairs. Now, what they want is for their chair company to make the best chairs, but they're not going to get shoddy chairs, you know, so they always are about. That's part of their thing about competitiveness. They want to be competitive. So they want quality and everything, but they do business with all kinds of, yeah. And indeed, I already mentioned, they have, you know, subsidiaries all over the world, which are not cooperatives. I'm just interested when they do subcontract out then, is there is that kind of subsidizing the cooperative model if they're if they're entering into the free market here where people are not cooperating together to mm -hmm. sort of negotiate up for better standards mm -hmm. then is that a, does that have anything to do with the way they're able to survive as a cooperative oh well they, i mean they get that as much as possible they want to they want to give do business within their own um, network cuz that's how they make it strong but they get that they're integrated into, Span into the Spanish economy, you know? But I don't think they're subsidized by the Spanish economy. Indeed, the Basque region is way better off because of Mondragon, you know? And indeed, like, um, the way the school, the university works, um, a significant part of the money that they get comes from the Basque government. And therefore, the Basque government is one of the, one of the groups that gets to have a say. You know, the teachers have a say, the students have a say, the boss government has a say, you know. They're always about that. So they interact on whatever level, you know. And on a, on a, a public school level, basically anybody in their region who's near a school can send their kids to it. You don't have to be in the cooperative. Anybody can send their kids to that school. And it costs 58, I think it's 58 euros a month to send your kids to that school. A school that'd be like this, which is pretty incredible. You know, we saw those schools, I mean, you know. Incredible teacher to student ratio, incredible, you know, career, you know, accessing the, the children's desire to learn, you know, schools, you know, um, what our charter schools should be, you know, um, you know, and so they all the time interact on whatever level, you know, they don't see themselves as like this separate thing, you know, they see them as, themselves as an integral part of their society, you know. And they feel they have a duty to contribute always, you know. But they also know that the way they stay strong and healthy is to support their cooperatives, you know, as much as they can. But they're all the time looking for business relationships with every, everything else, too, because they get that that's how you're dynamic, you know. Um, so does that answer the question? Uh, a little bit. <laughs> well, I want to comment on a different facet of it, which is... The, in the book there that um, on Mondragon that there are two copies of on the counter, uh, that there's an assumption oftentimes in kind of pop culture that cooperatives are inherently less competitive in the market than other types of business structures. And they make the point in the book that depending on the type of industry or business, co-ops can sometimes or even often be more competitive in the marketplace. They can be more effective at creating a product or service for a lower cost than other types of business structures because of the level of investment and ownership that co-op members have in that thing and the shared benefit. Uh, yeah, I yeah. totally get that. I yeah. get my, my worry is um, they, they are acting cooperatively within Mondragon, right? But Mondragon is like a giant capitalist. 
And so it, it when it cooperate when it uh, it relates to things outside of Mondragon, it relates as a capitalist, mm -hmm. right? They negotiate for the cheapest labor. Right. They well, negotiate for the cheapest they, price. They actually are pretty committed to not not yeah, yeah. They don't no, they're not gonna yeah. They're not gonna like, you know, go for the cheapest labor if it means that those they have you know, they always want to honor the work and stuff. So they're not gonna choose the cheapest labor if that means that those people are getting, you know, not taken care of. You know? No, they're they're about like walking their talk. You know, and indeed there was a um green drinking or whatever thing event. I talked about Mondragon about like you know, what's it called? Green again? drinks. Green Asheville drinks. Green yeah, drinks, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, you know, it's kind of hard to drink when you got to drive home. But you know, um, I went to it. You know, and they were talking about Mondragon. It was like maybe five, six years ago or something. And in the question and answer, I said, "What about that strike in Poland?" And the guy's like, "Everybody always asks about that strike in Poland." You know. <laughs> and I said, "Well, okay. No, I'm not trying to pick on it. Was it settled equitably?" And he said, "Yeah, of course. You know." But they, you know, they, they have moments where they're not in tune with who they're, who they're talking to and stuff. They're human, you know, and they're hard-nosed. I mean, they're going to do solid business, but they're not about exploitation anywhere, you know. That's one of their rules. That was my question. Is, yeah. is all this cooperative niceness that's going on kind of being upheld by yeah, no, this I think cutthroat yeah. capitalism that's happening yeah. exterior? Well, and I mean, they have to deal with that. So, okay, so they law, okay, actually... Diane pointed out to me. Do we need to take a break? I was say, yeah. Should we take five, ten minutes or something? Yeah. Yes. I mean, I would propose five minutes because we got an awful lot to say. Dan, you had something to say? Let Dan, let Dan add this. Yeah. Okay. This is just one thing, that a big takeaway from comparing what we do here to what they do there yeah. is they're still very much industrial. And they're making like car parts and they're making appliances. And yes, that steel has to be mined from somewhere, and yes, they're getting that steel at the cheapest price. So yeah, they're still competitive on a global market, and yes, it's because, to a degree, yeah, they're an extractive mm -hmm. economy. They're just like, their wealth is staying towards making their community the best that they can be. And that does come at a cost. I mean, it, environmental cost, yeah, somewhere yeah. else. Yeah, they, they have to deal with those contradictions. I'm gonna to get to, back to that, because that's how they lost their big industry. Okay, so let's take a break.